Well, first we'd like to welcome each and every one of you from the uh, Duffelfield area. Uh, we're excited about the partnerships that has been developed to uh, help to enlighten you on how to keep yourself safe and your family safe and to let you know uh, some of the things that are going on in the community. Uh, there's been several partnerships that have aligned themselves uh, to bring you this pertinent information. We have North Carolina Central University, Craven County Health Department, Craven County Schools, Holly Parker Health, First Missionary Baptist Church, the Elks Initiative, and the Greater Duffield Community. And we just like to welcome each and every one of you. And we also like to give a special welcome to our guests who uh, took the time out of their schedule to come and to assist us to be able to serve our community in a positive way. Okay. Uh, now we're going to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, which is uh, Dr. Robert Fisher. He's the medical director of Craven County Health Department. The he specializes in this pandemic from a medical perspective. Uh, we welcome you and it's glad to have you, Dr. Fisher. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. And, and thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, we're living through an extraordinary time together. It's a time of great challenge and hardship for many. And I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the pandemic, focusing on its effects in our community, its causes, prevention, and potential treatments. Much of this you may have already heard, but it bears repeating. There are many myths out there about this illness. So getting to basics, COVID-19 is an RNA virus. It crossed over from the animal population to humans in Wuhan, China around December. It spread from person to person, generally through droplets, from coughing and sneezing. It can survive on surfaces up to several days and be spread by contact as well. The amount of virus and the secretion from someone suffering from COVID-19 can be as much as a million viral copies per drop. But the virus can only infect you if it can get inside you. So if you're wearing a mask, you should be protected. You wash any virus off of your hands. These are the things that we try to have people do. The virus targets ACE receptors on the lining cells of the lungs, nose, and throat. It generally has an incubation period of five to seven days, and a person usually begins to experience symptoms within 12 days of contracting the virus, which is why people are asked to self-quarantine for two weeks if they are exposed to someone with the virus, since during this time, it is possible for them to spread the virus to others. The symptoms are most commonly fever and cough, with many patients experiencing fatigue, muscle aches, and less commonly, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. About 80 in 100 people have no symptoms to only mild symptoms, and they can be managed at home with self-isolation. 15 out of 100 have more difficulty breathing, may require oxygen, and often need hospitalization. And about five in 100 are the more severely ill that may require care in an intensive care unit, support from a mechanical ventilator, fluids, and medications to support their vital signs. There are a number of treatments being studied currently, but no cure currently exists, and there's no vaccine currently available, though there are ongoing clinical trials. The current strategy remains at attempting to slow the spread of the virus through the community and to protect vulnerable populations while effective treatments and a vaccine are sought. This is being accomplished through the current recommendations for physical distancing, wearing masks, washing hands, focused testing, and contact tracing. Courtney Chenoweth will be speaking more about testing and contact tracing in the next presentation. It has been an essential tool in our ability to contain this illness. The people at highest risk of hospitalization and death due to COVID-19 remain the elderly and those with other medical conditions, including 
chronic lung disease, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and cancer. We also know that COVID-19, unfortunately, like many other illnesses, has had a more devastating effect in communities of color, owing to longstanding systemic and social inequities. Harvard's Health Disparities Geocoding Project and other studies have shown that minority race, poverty, and crowding are associated with an increase in COVID-19 related deaths. In North Carolina, we have an African-American population of 21%, yet 31% of deaths have been among Black North Carolinians. We've seen similar statistics in Craven County. COVID-19 has shown a light on these disparities, including the effects of discrimination, chronic toxic stress, decreased healthcare access, gaps in education, income and wealth, food insecurity, and crowded housing, as well as a higher incidence of many chronic illnesses. These are great challenges requiring long-term solutions with no quick fixes. In the near term, the focus needs to be on preserving every precious life in this community. To decrease the spread of this virus through our community it is important to follow the three W's. Wear a mask, watch your distance, wash your hands frequently. It is important not to touch the eyes, nose, or mouth with unwashed hands as you can introduce the virus into the body. Washing with soap and water for 20 seconds is recommended, as well as the use of an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Care for your whole self body, mind, and spirit is essential, recognizing that everything that we take into our bodies, from the food and water we consume to the media we choose, has an effect on our health. It is important to try to eat well, maintain healthy sleep, exercise, spend time outdoors, minimize our stress, and find ways to maintain social connection. Holly Parker will have more to say on care of the self and improving our immunity later in this presentation. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, we have seen increases in depression, anxiety, alcohol and substance abuse, domestic violence and overdoses. It is important to maintain compassion for ourselves and others and to seek help in these challenging situations. There's a North Carolina mental health helpline which can be called toll free at 855-587-3463. We will also be talking about other available resources later in the presentation. These are unprecedented times, and there's been a great deal of suffering through loss of life and livelihood, and in the changes in our way of life and our sense of connectedness and shared humanity. It has been particularly difficult with the population of people who live in skilled nursing facilities, who are our grandmothers and grandfathers, aunts and uncles, sisters and brothers, and who have only been able to see family through the windows of their facility. We've recently, unfortunately, had a number of outbreaks in local nursing facilities, and facility staff will now be undergoing COVID-19 testing every two weeks. Many caregivers reside in this community and slowing the spread of the virus here in our communities will help them be able to continue in their vital caregiving roles. I'd like to thank you all for your time and kind attention. And I'll now turn this back over to Dr. Holmes, but we'll be happy to try to respond to any questions after the other presentations. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. And we do uh, solicit uh, any questions uh, that you might have or desire to raise, and we will address those questions uh, at the end of the presentations. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Courtney Ch Chanaworth. Uh, she's communicable, communicable disease are in Craven County Health Department, and she specializes in contact tracing and testing. Thank you, Courtney. 
Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so um, I am the communicable disease nurse at Craven County Health Department. And um, so since the pandemic began um, and reached North Carolina, my job has been to help with testing people, um, but also to do case investigations and contact tracing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that this evening. So um, I'll start with basically what happens when someone tests positive for COVID-19. Um, the first thing that happens is um, whomever completed the testing, whatever doctor um, does the testing, has to report that to the health department. And once we have a case of COVID-19 reported to us, um, myself and there are a couple of other nurses who then contact the case to interview them, um, a lot of the questions we ask you are um, part for, um, for statistical information. Um, so we'll ask you questions about the symptoms you were experiencing, um, your, if you have a history of any chronic health problems, um, and then we'll also go through a risk history where we ask you things. Have you traveled within the last two weeks before you became sick? Uh, were you around anyone that you knew was sick? Um, and then we ask other things like, have you attended any social gatherings? Um, where do you work? Um, and all of that leads into um, the contact tracing piece. So um, for the contact tracing piece, basically we start if um, like Dr. Fisher was mentioning, some people don't have symptoms at all with the virus, where others do. So if you didn't have symptoms, we would look at 48 hours um, before you tested positive. Or if you do have symptoms, we look at 48 hours prior to your symptom onset. And that's the date that we start with. And we ask you basically, where have you been or who have you been around from that starting point up until the point you went into isolation? So we try to gather the names and phone numbers of anyone that you may have been around. So then from that point, we can actually contact each person to let them know that um, they have been exposed to COVID-19 and they can be educated on the quarantine process, which would be 14 days from their last exposure. Um, and also so we can help coordinate um, them to get testing completed because um, that is now recommended that um, any time you have an exposure to COVID-19 regardless of the fact if you have symptoms or not it is recommended that you get a test. Um, we also work with employers um, because there's when people work you know in places say like a daycare or a restaurant there's typically a lot of questions um, as to what those places need to do to proceed if they need to close down. Um, so that's part of our job as well. Um, but one thing um, that is important to know is we do try to keep this process as confidential as, as possible. So when we contact someone to let them know that um, they've been named as a contact to COVID-19, we do not give the positive person's name. Um, basically, we just let the person know your name has been given, and from there, we ask them to do the quarantine and recommend the testing. Um, so it's just really important to remember that, one, if you test positive for COVID-19, that you remain in isolation until you've met the requirements to be considered recovered. Um, but also, if you are a contact to COVID-19, even if you feel healthy um, or you test negative, it's important to also remain in quarantine until your 14 days has passed. Because um, what one thing that's really important that a lot of people don't realize is even if you do test negative, the reason, as Dr. Fisher spoke about that 14 day period, um, there's still a chance that you could become sick or develop symptoms. So, you know, once you've reached the 14 days at that point, if you're still healthy, you tested negative, then you would be considered clear. Um, but otherwise, we do um, want you to stay home because if, you know, you're infected and you stay home, the virus stops with you versus if you continue to go out or visit friends or family all of those people, it's a domino effect. Um, you know, if you were to get sick or test positive, then it carries on that we have to contact all of those people. 
Um, so it's just really, really important um, to, to stay home um, either in isolation or quarantine if you're positive or a contact. Um, so another thing that's really important is um, with everything I've told you, if you did test positive or you are a contact, you are going to be receiving a phone call from either the health department or now in North Carolina, we actually have um, contract people that are set up to help with contact tracing. So um, you, you may get a, a phone call from a strange number, um, but the person will identify themselves. Um, and sometimes, you know, if we cannot reach people on the phone, we'll send a letter to your home. Um, but it's just really important for contact tracing to work. We have to have um, cooperation from the public. Um, so if you do get a phone call from the health department or a contact tracer, just know nobody's in trouble. Um, basically, our job is to just, you know, get this education to people um, so that they can take the next steps to take care of themselves and also prevent spreading the virus to others. Um, along with um, the contact tracing, I'm also going to talk a little bit about testing. Right now, the health department is offering a drive up test clinic um, and it's by appointment only. And we do it every Tuesday morning and then every Friday morning. Um, so if if you think you've been exposed to COVID-19, you feel like you have symptoms of COVID-19 or, you know, any other reason that you think you may need a test, you're, you're always welcome to contact the health department and we can get you scheduled um, in that drive up clinic. Um, all you do is you'll, you'll drive into the parking lot at the health department. There is a station where you get checked in. Um, they'll just verify your ID. If you have insurance, you can bring your card. If you don't have insurance, then that, that's also fine. Um, you'll get checked in and then you just drive up to another tent and that is where the nurses actually just will swab you. You don't even have to get out of your car. So it's a very quick and simple process. Um, right now, depending on what laboratory is used when you're tested, um, the time frame for getting a test result back is different. Um, LabCorp, which is a commercial lab a lot of places are using, um, we're seeing about a 48 hour to 72 hour turnaround time with lab results. Um, with our state lab here in North Carolina, it's running close to a week um, and times do vary um, depending on how inundated these labs get with, with testing. Um, so, so you're always able to call and set up an appointment at the health department for testing. Um, the other option is there are urgent cares available. Um, and if you do have your pri a primary care physician, you can always contact them. Um, we just generally recommend calling ahead of time versus showing up at any place um, just so um, you know if an appointment is required that way, required that way they can be prepared um, to get you taken care of. Um, so th thank you so much for your time tonight and um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you Courtney. Uh, we appreciate it. Yes, and, uh, uh, we uh, will solicit questions at the end of all of our presenters. Our, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Holly Parker. She's a functional medicine RN. Uh, Holly Parker's health building resilience uh, during this pandemic. She'll help us to understand how we should better prepare to take care of ourselves and our family. Thank you, Ms. Holly. Thank you, Dr. Holmes, and good, e good evening, everyone. So yes, my goal for this evening is to just talk a little bit about boosting immunity and building resiliency um, to this virus. And I just want you to know that when I'm talking about some of these things, they also overlap into all of health. So they're great foundations just to have in general, whether we're talking about fighting a virus or not. Um, as Dr. Fisher mentioned, we're seeing populations that have comorbidities such as, you know, the high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic lung disease, obesity. They're at much higher risk of not only getting COVID, but having more problems down the line. Um, death is at much higher risk. So in talking about these things, They'll also address, you know, how we fight some of these comorbidities as well. So my goal is to just give you some basic um, 
nutrition, lifestyle tips, and to empower you to take your health into your own hands. So these are things you can start today. Um, the first one is nutritionally, uh, ways to boost your immunity. Um, always, obviously, more fruits and vegetables are, are always going to be the go-to. One thing I try to tell people is to think about eating the rainbow. Um, not talking about Skittles, but just talking about eating all the colors. So, um, you know, your, your reds and your oranges and your greens and all of those different colors of our foods have different vitamins. They have different antioxidants and things that just really um, help boost our immunity, fight inflammation, things like that. So um, ideally, you'd want like eight servings of vegetables a day, two servings of fruits, and that's about half cup servings. If you're not there, let's just get try to get more in. Um, other foods like garlics and onion, um, different spices like cinnamon and turmeric, oregano, those are all um, super great at um, helping fight different viruses and bacteria and decreasing inflammation. Um, reducing sugars is a huge one. So whether that's from, you know, different drinks, um, sodas, juices, um, sweets, if, if we can help reduce that, that's, that's just going to help our immunity. Every time we ingest sugar, um, it actually suppresses our immune system. Some studies say for up to a few hours. So that's a huge one, just trying to reduce that sugar intake. Um, and one more is just water, drinking more water. Um, as a society as a whole, we often <laughs> fail to drink enough water. I'm not going to give ounces because I know that there's certain medical conditions that, that they're restricted um, on how many ounces they can drink. But what I will suggest is that if you are drinking sodas or teas, sweet tea, um, juices, if you can just swap those out for water, you'll be doing your body great favor. Um, every cell in our body needs water to function. And if we're not providing, if we're dehydrated, it's not functioning optimally, but it's also just helping, um, you know, get all those toxins or in this case, virus and infections, um, uh, eliminating it from our body. So super important. Um, another big foundation you should consider is just how much activity you're getting. So it's recommended for the average healthy person to get about 150 minutes of moderate exercise a week. Um, if you're not there, I just encourage you to move your body more. Um, when we move our body, it gets the blood circulating. Um, it brings our white blood cells, which are our, our fighter cells. That's the one that's going to kill the infections and stuff throughout the body. Um, it actually helps produce more. And so, you know, if you can set a goal to move your body every hour, you know, get up and take a walk around the house, go for a little walk outside. Um, if that means you have your chair and you just sit in your chair, stand up and down five times, if that's where you're at perfect. That gets the blood flowing. So, um, but we're meant to move. And when we're sitting stagnant all day, it just, it really decreases our immune system and leads to all those other com comorbidities um, that were mentioned before. So, you know, there's a ton of different body weight exercises you can YouTube. And, you know, if, if certain um, facilities aren't home, there's walking trails in New Bern. Um, walking is just great great for so many different reasons. Um, reduces stress, you're getting outside, you're getting the vitamin D, which has been shown that people who um, have COVID or respond poorly are often deficient in vitamin D. So the more we're getting that, the better. Um, another foundation that's imperative is sleep, also something that many of us are lacking. And so you know, it's when we sleep that we actually restore um, our body and heal our body. So if you're deficient in that, or your immune system's not being restored and healed. Um, we also release certain um, uh, proteins that help fight infection while we sleep. So if you're not sleeping, those aren't being released and we can't fight infection as well. So what I recommend is seven to eight hours a night uh, minimum, and then you're going to start seeing 
um, that's when you feel the most rejuvenated and restored. Um, the best way to do that is to try to get into a sleep routine. So, you know, you want to go to bed around the same time every night. You want to wake up around the same time every morning. And that just helps get our sleep-wake cycle in sync. So our body knows, okay, it's light out. It's time to be awake. It's time to have energy. Um, when it starts to get dark, our body says, okay, it's time to slow down. It's time to rest. It's time to start healing. So just try to get into that routine. Um, there's some relaxations I'll talk about in a little bit, relaxation techniques that may help. Um, but again, just getting outside is imperative uh, for this whole sleep-wake cycle and making sure we're seeing sunlight during the day. So, you know, it's, again, something that we're, we're very deficient on and can truly affect our immune system. And then the last foundation I'll talk about is stress management. Um, I think we all need a little bit of this. So, you know, the data is very clear that increased levels of stress increase your susceptibility to not only viral infections, but all disease. So the higher our stress level is, the more likely we are to get disease, infections, all of it. So, um, you know, there's so many different ways we can try to reduce stress, but just some simple tips here. Um, you know, prayer and meditation go a long way. So just those two things alone, um, they reduce our, our stress levels, our um, stress hormones. And when we reduce the stress hormones, it helps increase our immunity and vice versa. So when the stress hormones are high, our immunity is low. Um, so, you know, prayer speaks for itself. Some, there's some meditation apps out there. I use one that's free called Insight Timer. Um, great thing to do every day. Just really helps reduce um, the stress in your body, mind. Another thing is just breathing exercises. We often surprisingly forget to breathe when we're stressed out. And when we breathe, it just helps reset that stress response. So a simple, there's so many different ones out there, but a simple one um, is called square breathing. So what you do is you inhale for four, hold your breath for four, exhale for four, and then hold for four. And just keep doing that. And the whole time, you're just going to focus on the breath, focus on the breath, not focusing on anything else going on. And it just helps reduce that stress level, which therefore would increase your immunity. Um, it just resets, you know, whatever's going on, it can just help put a pause on things and, and um, get on a better track, hopefully. Um, another one that I highly recommend is taking a break from social media, taking a break from the news, taking a break from all of this stuff that's going on. Um, you know, there's so much information, misinformation, fear, all types of stuff out there. I promise you, if you take a break for a day or two, it'll still be there when you get back. Um, I just did this recently and it's the best thing ever. It's you feel <laughs> so rejuvenated. Um, but when we're, we're being bombarded with all of this information all the time, um, and this stuff's scary, you know, and all of the things going on in the world right now are, it's, it's not fun. It's not pretty. So just take a break and step back from that. Um, go, you know, go for the walk, read the book, um, do something fun, you know, <laughs> something like laughter. There's lots of research on how much laughter can actually boost immunity, Call the friend that's funny, find a funny clip. Um, the, it's those little things that can actually add up to make a big difference. So, um, and I just encourage the people who are home with kids. I know that's been a huge concern. It's hard to speak to. One thing I know for sure is the more we can get in routine with them, with ourselves, that's, that's definitely going to help. So I know things are messy right now, but if we can try to get into that routine, it should help reduce the stress. And like uh, Dr. Fisher mentioned, the rate of, um, you know, neglect, suicide, uh, terrible things happening. Um, if, if you are in need, please, please, please reach out. There are services in New Bern. Um, there's Port Health. 
Um, there's RHA behavioral health. Um, if you look on uh, nc211.org, there and you just type in zip code of where you are, it, you can list all the mental health providers, it can list food sources, it can list housing, just a ton of different services um, offered in the area. So that's a very comprehensive place to look. So um, again, very brief presentation, but um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel, please feel free to ask. Uh, thank you, Holly. Uh, we sure appreciate and uh, look forward to the questions. Our last speaker is uh, Carl Ipot from Craven County School Board Member, District 3. And he's gonna talk to uh, the Plan C, the Back to School Program. Uh, we welcome you, uh, Carl. Uh, thank you, Dr. Holmes. Um, I'm having a little difficulty with my video. It comes in and out. I'm on a satellite connection and uh, if a bird flies by, that sometimes will disturb images. If I can get myself back, I will. But um, we certainly appreciate this opportunity to join the panel tonight and to talk with community about uh, these issues that um, are very pressing on all of us. Uh, one of which, of course, is going to be the schools and the school schedule. Uh, we realize that the school schedule places a real hard hardship on a lot of people, our whole community, as a matter of fact, um, whether we're in or out under the circumstances that we're going through, there's a lot of fear and anxiety uh, that's shared by many. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the actual health of our students. We know that they will do best if they're in the classroom and uh, connected directly with the teacher. Under the uh, plan that the governor offered and allowed us to look at, we had what was called a plan B, and we were going aggressively towards starting schools next week, I believe uh, on the 17th, I should say, um, under plan B um, with the spacing that is required. Um, the spacing is 50%, so if you can imagine, uh, you're cutting every classroom into uh, pods of half the students and spacing them out. And then of course, there are the issues of making sure you also have the distancing, uh, food service in the classroom and things of that nature, just to uh, minimize the uh, any kind of overlapping of students. Also, it included an AA schedule and a BB schedule. So in elementary, you'd have your students there Monday and Tuesday on the AA. Wednesday was a total clean day Thursday and Friday or for the BB students. All students in, are in school every day, but the days you're not in the classroom, including Wednesday, you're in a virtual environment uh, with your teacher. Um, as we got closer to having to make a final decision uh, at our last uh, board meeting there in September, we realized a number of things. We've been extensively uh, doing surveys of our teachers, of our parents, um, um, staff very involved, of course. Um, and what we were seeing that uh, our community divided out a third, a third, and a third. A third that had uh, significant fear about returning to the classroom and wanting to be totally virtual. A third that basically would be accepting of either way, and then a third that absolutely wanted to be in the classroom. And um, so we went further and we interviewed teachers to understand better um, what the issues were in terms of their personal health and risk and their personal fear. And the numbers that came back uh, for that were quite uh, significant that we had to consider. And then the other element that uh, was giving us problems was that we had not received the PPE to be able to open schools. And we did not actually have the date that we knew that we would have the PPE uh, available for students from uh, kindergarten all the way through. Uh, since that time, uh, much of the uh, PPE equipment has been received. And uh, we, we think we're gonna be in good shape there. 
But uh, coming down to the 11th hour, we decided, uh, given the fact that our local numbers still were rising, they weren't declining, um, that it was best. Uh, also, uh, I should add, we had a number of uh, unexpected uh, teacher retirements. The uh, concerns and fears were that great uh, that that increased that problem. Um, we did plan on a full virtual school and almost 4,000 uh, students signed up for the virtual school. And here we are uh, in the board meeting trying to wrestle through all of this information, knowing that above all the uh, safety and welfare of students and our uh, teachers had to be at the front of any decision we made. We elected to go to plan C which is virtual for the first nine weeks. And uh, so that is the plan that we will be opening on the 17th with. Um, again, we certainly apologize for the hardship this creates. Uh, we'll be much in the mode that we were last March, uh, this past March when we had to stop school and go virtual. I will say that we're in much better situation now um, in that the, um, Many of the issues and problems we had in the startup in March have been resolved. We do have significant uh, issues that we still have to address in the very western part of the county and also in the Harlow area where uh, we're still working on good connectivity uh, for students. So we're asking our uh, community resources, churches, and other sites in those areas that have difficulty um, having online to provide space um, uh, with the appropriate distancing and, and uh, care being taken and um, help to have students in pods that can get to a place that they can actually be on. Uh, when we looked at the numbers, though, it has it was surprising that it was a very small number, and that makes it better in that you can really target your uh, focus on those remaining um, places that you've got to get help to make sure they have hot spots and connectivity. Um, I know that there are probably a number of questions. Um, and I'm not sure if I should go through the whole list of everything I have or just wait for questions to come uh, in uh, keeping with the time that we've got this evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ipot. Um, and uh, at this time, we want to uh, bring in uh, for our question and answer period, uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, Regari, who uh, has been instrumental in putting this uh, program together and aligning the speakers. And we appreciate uh, the hard work that he has put into bringing this information to our community. Thank you, Jeff. Arlene, or am I you? Which one are you? Yeah. Do you want to be this one? Well, yeah. no, I don't have. Right. He's uh, he has just walked into the room, so um, I'm gonna slide out of view. Actually, I'm gonna rename my for myself first. Um, just in case folks who are watching are like, that doesn't match the name. So here we go. We're gonna switch seats real quick. The man behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Um, as you know, as you know, the program you know was to solicit comments or questions uh, from our Facebook feed. Um, you all have done an excellent job. Um, we were just speaking here behind the scenes on how this has been a very informative presentation that'll probably get a lot more views um, over time as we keep it posted on our on the city's webpage. But we don't have any questions. Uh, we didn't receive any questions. So if you all feel like you just needed. If someone else was uh, bringing up something that jarred your memory or something that you forgot to say, um, we still have some time. We have about 20 minutes of allocated time. If you feel like um, there's more you need to add to what anybody uh, has said or what you have said, feel free. Um, but in the meantime, this, is, this has been excellent and I appreciate all your time. Um, and it's, it's good to see, oh, I saw, we saw Cara there for a second and he disappeared. The bird must have flew by. Um, so anyways, uh, so it's up to you all. Um, Dr. Holmes, uh, we can carry on or, or we can close yeah. it out. So thank you very much. 
Okay. Well, uh, uh, there were some uh, extended uh, things that people wanted to relay. So I think we'll take advantage of this 20 minutes and open the floor back up to our, presenta our presentators and our presenters. Uh, we'll start again. We'll go right down the line. Uh, Dr. Fisher. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I'm just, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to engage in this group tonight. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in trying to figure out ways that uh, the health department can be of greater service to the community. Um, and my hope is that in the coming weeks, we'll be able to, to move in that direction. Um, we talked in my presentation about the, um, some of the structural problems that have that have led to health disparities that exist. And these are long-term problems. Um, and I, I want to um, uh, find ways creatively that these issues can be addressed in a good way. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fisher. Courtney? So, you're all right. up. All right. Um, so, thank thank you for letting me be a part of this presentation tonight. Um, I guess the biggest thing I wanted to stress to the community is, um, don't be fearful when we call to answer the phone and talk to us. Um, no, no one's in trouble. Um, like I said, our goal is to stop the spread of the virus. So. Um, we're just really there to give education and guidance um, and to get people in touch with healthcare providers. Um, you know, like I said, if they need testing or, or anything further. So, um, so just know when we call, um, we're, we're here to help and, um, and, and don't be afraid to talk to us or give us the names of the contacts of people that you may have been around um, so that we can reach out to make sure everybody has the opportunity um, to get tested or um, to, to stay home. Thank you. And we want to uh, reiterate uh, an important part that Courtney just shared with us. If you have any reservations uh, and you would like to talk to somebody before you uh, talk to Courtney, don't be afraid to get in contact uh, with me here, uh, Dr. Holmes at First Missionary Baptist Church because it's important that we understand that we must become participants in attacking this COVID-19. This is a situation that we can't do as individuals. We have to attack it together. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah. Holly? Um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, our main focus of this Redevelopment Commission is to go into these underserved communities and build health and wellness, you know, going forward. This is just one small hot topic we're, we're touching on right now because it's a hot topic. But we want to hear from you. Like, that's the whole goal of this is we want to hear from the community. What do you need? What health issues are you facing? How have disparities affected you? Um, and we want to build partnerships and provide resources to help you. So um, that's our goal here, and and yeah, that's what I wanted to say is we're <laughs> we're here for you. This is just a presentation, obviously, on COVID, but the whole goal is to build health and wellness in general. Um, so anyway, um, you know, the more questions, the better. That's that's how we know what you need, and so please feel free to to reach out and direct us. Thank you, Holly. Uh, Mr. Ipot? Um, to follow Holly, I would say exactly the same thing, that um, we're using the Craven County Schools website to get information out as quickly as we possibly can. But if you have difficulty getting information or answers to your questions there, you're welcome to call 514-6333. 
and you will be put in contact with uh, the right people to answer your questions. Um, I will add that, of course, one of our big concerns is that there are students that need the extra help getting started reading, uh, the students that uh, certainly are exceptional and need extra hands-on help are uh, highly on our mind, and we're looking at every avenue we can to figure out how we can better serve them at the same time we have this otherwise virtual environment. Um, we are using transportation to deliver devices at those locations that we know we still have to get them out. And um, what we're going to be doing for uh, lunch uh, services, uh, food services, is actually giving packets to uh, that are delivered to sites that uh, can be picked up. And uh, when we're back to our plan B, we'll have uh, also the ability to send uh, packages home with students for uh, food on those days that they're not actually in the classroom. Um, again, if you do have questions, though, please feel free to contact us um, and uh, go on the school website for the latest information or call 514-6333. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Ipop. Uh, and our closing remarks, we just want to thank each and every one of you who uh, took the time to show concern for uh, our community. Uh, we look forward to uh, continue to work together uh, to meet the needs of, of this community. Uh, I want to thank those that are participants that uh, have been so instrumental uh, in putting uh, this coalition together. Uh, my friend, Ms. Chu, uh, who keeps me informed of everything that's going on. Um, but my last remark is that it's important at this particular time during this pandemic that uh, we understand that we cannot solve this thing uh, individually. We must solve it as a group. We must come together. We must continue to share information and to share concern for our community. And I believe as long as we put our community first, our heart is in the right place, that we'll be successful in getting through this time period. And not only successful, but to come out better than when we started. Thank each and every one again. I enjoy and I appreciate. Thank you all. Well, Dr. Thank Fish, we, we did get some questions that came in while y'all were talking. so. Um, okay. We posted that in in the chat. I'm not sure if you can I, read it, Doctor Fisher. I can, I can you see that it. one. Yeah. So we did get a question. So uh, the question was, do we have a central place for people to quarantine? Was one question. So Doctor Fisher, maybe the so, best thing. Maybe the best. So answer. that uh, we don't really have a central place to quarantine oh, no. uh, if if you're not ill enough to be hospitalized. If you're ill enough to be hospitalized which would mean you're short of breath, you need oxygen, you're having chest pain, you're having other symptoms that are bad enough, um, then you would wind up in the hospital where they have uh, two designated units to manage patients with COVID. Um, when those patients are stabilized enough um, and they're able to breathe well enough on room air without needing oxygen, they can be discharged home to continue in home isolation. But uh, quarantine is really, for, for people that are well enough, quarantine is in the home. Um, okay, great. Question. The next question is, uh, yeah. looks like where, where, can, where can people get antibody tests? Yeah. Um, I think there may be some private offices doing that. You'd have to call around. We don't do them at the health department at this point. Um, the next question, maybe Courtney can chime in on this one, is, is the health department testing asymptomatic people who have attended a mass gathering or who are living in congregate living facilities? So yes, we, we will test um, asymptomatic people. Um, and if you do have a risk factor, that would put you at high risk for having COVID-19 or having been exposed to COVID-19, then, then we can test you. Um, and that's gonna be regardless of symptoms or not. Um, and we definitely will test anyone 
who works at or you know lives in a nursing home or prison all of those congregate type settings are considered high risk and um, we'll definitely um, make sure that that those individuals get tested and the last question was about free testing so um, at the health department I know um, we can do free testing through the state lab um, but um, that depends on what testing supplies we have on hand. Um, we do sometimes use LabCorp, um, and for that you would receive a bill. Um, but with um, the state lab, we can offer free testing through them as long as we have the supplies on hand. If, if I could also add a comment, sure. uh, because it seems to fit here nicely. Um, uh, we celebrate our partners here on the screen, our friends there at the health department, our school nurses or our on the ground in the schools people that are doing all of the uh, data gathering, contact tracing internal to the school population, and then working hand in hand with our health department. Uh, folks to make sure that uh, if we have an event, we can get um, the proper attention as quickly as possible. Okay, we have one more question for you, Carr, uh, that just came in. Is Craven County Schools accepting laptops as donations? Mm. Uh, oh. I would have to say that the Craven County Schools are always happy to receive any kind of <laughs> gift from the community because we have lots of students and there are lots of needs out there. Um, so again, if uh, the individual would call 514-6333, um, they will be able to uh, talk to someone who can tell them what to do to make a donation. And we certainly appreciate that. Cool. Okay, we have one more question funneling in. I do just want to chime in quick. I believe the um, uh, Red Cross, if you are donating blood, they will do an antibody test. Yes. I've known some people who've done that. So yep, that's, that's they're correct. short on blood. So if you go mm -hmm. give blood, donate blood, you can also get your antibodies tested. So that's one way. We have one more testing question coming in. Um, and it's, is, is testing being done at the prisons and nursing homes and assisted living facilities? So yes, um, that they are doing tested in those places. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Uh, uh, briefly, can you uh, just explain the antibody test uh, in, uh, refer in preference to the regular test so that people can get a better understanding of it? Sure. So the testing that we're doing to screen people, there's two types. There's a, there's a rapid antibody test, and that's from a nasal swab. And there's a, a PCR, a different type of test, but it's also done through a nasal swab that's more accurate. It takes a little longer to do. Um, antibody tests are tests measuring the body's um, immune response to the virus. So if you have elevated antibodies, you've had COVID-19 at some point in the past. Um, so it's a blood test. Um, but it's not as useful in looking at people in an acute situation. It's useful in saying a person has had this infection before. Thank you. Any last remarks? That's it. Thank you. Wear, okay. wear a mask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> distance. Yes. We want to stay wash. six feet apart when we're when we're with others, mm -hmm. and wash hands frequently. Be safe, everyone. And, and if I could add to uh, Dr. Fisher and his statement there, um, we as schools want to get our students back as quickly as possible. And the way we're going to be able to do that, make that decision toward the end of September for the next nine weeks is if our numbers are low, if we're all following the proper protocols and we're pushing these numbers down, then we can afford to have students in classrooms under a plan B uh, that'll be much more acceptable, I think, to everyone. Thank you. Uh, again, we thank each and every one of you. And if there's anyone 
uh, in the Newburn area that's in need of supplies, masks or other supplies, please get in touch with us here at the First Missionary Baptist Church on Cypress Street, and we will uh, do all we can to make sure that you have enough supplies for your home, for yourself, and for your family. Thank you again, each and every one, and everyone have enjoy and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.